Thermobaric weapons have the potential to eliminate everyone inside a fortified structure without causing external damage. These munitions create a two-part explosion, spreading highly flammable fuel and igniting it to create a devastating shockwave. Countries like the United States and Russia actively employ thermobaric weapons, but their use often requires high-level authorization due to their indiscriminate nature. How do they compare to conventional explosives? And what challenges do vacuum bombs pose in civilian populated zones? Join us to discover what a vacuum bomb does to a building. Let's dig a bit deeper into the world of thermobaric weapons. These things aren't your run-of-the-mill explosives. They're the heavy hitters, the disruptors that make you sit up and take notice. Imagine an aerosol, also known as a vacuum bomb, in the spotlight. It's not playing around, it disperses an aerosol cloud packed with gas, liquid, or powdered explosive. We're talking next-level stuff here. What sets these beasts apart is that they're almost 100% fuel. None of that fuel oxidizer premix mumbo-jumbo is straight-up fuel making them way more energetic pound for pound than your regular explosives. And that fuel? It's often elemental, giving it that extra kick. They're versatile, too. Fit them in handheld launchers or launch them straight from airplanes. These weapons know how to make an entrance. But here's the catch. They're oxygen addicts. Underwater? Nope. High altitude? No. Bad weather? It's not their scene. Where they shine, though, is in enclosed spaces, tunnels, buildings, and any cozy, non-sealed field fortifications. Throw them into the mix and you have a recipe for a spectacular show. So here's the play-by-play. -play. The initial explosive charge does its thing, hits the target, cracks open the container, and bam, the fuel mixture is unleashed as a cloud. And that blast wave? It's not your ordinary quickie explosion. It lingers and dances around thanks to a thermobaric flame front that accelerates into a large volume. It's not just about a blast front from a single source. It's about creating pressure fronts in the mix of fuel and oxidant even in the surrounding air. Now let's talk science. Thermobaric explosives draw inspiration from accidental unconfined vapor cloud explosions. Think back to the good old days when flour mills and coal mines were the hot spots for dust explosions. Fast forward to today and it's all about oil tankers, refinery tanks, and vessels. Remember the Buntsfield fire in the UK in 2005? That blast wave woke people up 150 kilometers away. That's the kind of impact we're talking about. What's inside these bombs? A container packed with fuel with a little conventional explosive scatter charge at the center. It ranges from powdered metals like aluminum or magnesium to organic materials, maybe with a self-contained partial oxidant. And don't blink, nanofuels have entered the scene, bringing that futuristic touch. Now the real magic happens in the effectiveness department. How potent these bombs get depends on how well the fuel spreads, how fast it mixes with the air, and when the igniter gets into action. Some designs play it smart, using strong munitions cases to contain the blast pressure. This gives the fuel a chance to heat up beyond its auto-ignition temperature. Picture this. The container bursts, and the superheated fuel catches fire progressively as it meets atmospheric oxygen. It's like a slow-burning fuse leading to a big bang. But it's not all smooth sailing. There are upper and lower limits to consider, like the flammability of the fuel. Blast from the dispersal charge can mess with the lower limit, while the upper limit plays a role in igniting fogs above oil pools. Yet clever designs tackle these weaknesses. Preheating the fuel way above its ignition temperature minimizes ignition delay during dispersion. Let's delve into the intricate world of thermobaric munitions, a class of explosive devices designed to unleash heightened heat and pressure compared to their conventional counterparts. Their unique modus operandi involves exploding a vapor in the blast zone, primarily focusing on airborne fuel air explosives, FAEs. While the United States has predominantly concentrated on airborne applications, Russia has exhibited versatility by incorporating thermobaric elements into a wide array of weaponry, spanning from airborne bombs to rifle grenades. In the aftermath of a detonation, the medical repercussions are primarily attributed to the phenomenon of primary blast injury, the targeted physiological areas include organs of varying densities, such as the lungs, bowel, and inner ear. The severity and onset of damage hinge on factors like the distance from the blast and the victim's orientation. Diagnostic procedures rely on straightforward investigative techniques to unravel the intricate medical tapestry of these explosive events. 
Termed fuel air explosives, FAEs are engineered to amplify temperature and pressure relative to conventional explosives. Their distinctive trait lies in inducing a significantly higher incidence of primary blast injuries than traditional counterparts, making them formidable players in explosive weaponry. Tracing the historical trajectory, the genesis of thermobaric munitions can be linked back to the German Army of World War II. A pioneering experiment featured a six-barreled 15cm Nebelwerfer rocket launcher on the Eastern Front, where one round carried propane gas and subsequent rounds set the stage for explosive vapor. The narrative, however, witnessed a hiatus until the 1960s, when the United States ushered in the era of FAEs during the Vietnam War. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union embraced thermobaric weaponry during the Afghan conflict, and Russia continues to deploy these munitions, showcasing a diverse arsenal encompassing aircraft bombs, rockets, and ground-launched variants down to a man-portable scale. As we delve into the scientific intricacies of thermobaric munitions, one pressing question looms. How do these advanced weapons harness the power of science to unleash such unprecedented levels of destruction and chaos? In the initial stage, the weapon releases an explosive charge that disseminates an aerosol reminiscent of vaporized gasoline, saturating the designated area. A second charge is triggered following this ominous precursor, setting the aerosol fog ablaze. This triggers a chain reaction resulting in a massive blast, towering flames, a formidable pressure wave, and a vacuum effect. This vacuum emerges as oxygen from the surrounding air is voraciously consumed, creating a lethal environment. In explosive weaponry, thermobaric munitions stand out as a formidable force, operating on a distinctive principle that sets them apart from conventional explosives. This detailed exploration unveils these munitions' intricate workings and far-reaching consequences, delving into their composition, effects, and the arsenal of nations wielding their power. Thermobaric munitions initiate their destructive journey by dispersing an aerosol cloud of gases, liquids, or finely powdered explosives. This volatile mixture has been reported to contain known fuels such as ethylene oxide, propylene oxide, ammonium nitrate, and powdered PETN. The ensuing cloud flows adeptly around objects, infiltrating cavities and structures, even penetrating small openings in buildings, bunkers, and the engine bays of armored vehicles before meeting its fiery destiny through ignition. The culmination of this process births a plasma cloud, a seething tempest that attains temperatures ranging between 2,500 to 3,000 degrees Celsius. Notably, this cloud's burn time is deliberately prolonged compared to conventional high explosives. To enhance this duration, aluminum powder is incorporated into some explosive compositions. The protracted blast wave or overpressure, reaching a staggering 73 kilograms per square centimeter, 1,000 lbs Q in, emerges as the pivotal factor behind the lethality and destructiveness of these munitions. Particularly in confined spaces, the blast wave ricochets, subjecting the target to a barrage of insults and intensifying the severity of injuries. Yet the impact extends beyond the blast wave. The burning effects are equally ominous. The explosion engulfs the surroundings, consuming all available oxygen and creating a vacuum that mercilessly draws loose objects into its void. In cases where the explosive fails to detonate, the affected area becomes a potential toxic hazard, mainly when substances like ethylene oxide known for its use in sterilization within the health industry, are employed. This raises the specter of accusations related to chemical warfare if such situations were to materialize. Now let's drill down into what happens when these thermobaric weapons go to town. When these bad boys are confined, they kick off a series of reflective shockwaves that keep the fireball burning, extending its show to 10 to 50 milliseconds. It's like a fiery dance where exothermic recombination reactions lead. But as the gases cool down and the pressure takes a nosedive, things get interesting. A partial vacuum takes the stage, and here's where the misnomer vacuum bomb comes into play. Don't be fooled, it's not a vacuum in the literal sense, but the rarefaction effect adds a layer of intensity to the spectacle. Picture this. Piston-type afterburning is believed to make a grand entrance in such structures. The flames kick it up a notch, accelerating through and leaving their mark. It's not just a one-time bang, it's a performance that lasts, leaving its audience in awe. Let's switch gears to the fuel air explosive, FAE, game. Imagine a device with a fuel container, and not one but two explosive charges. Dropping or firing this munition sets the stage. The first charge does the honors, 
bursting open the container at a predetermined height and letting the fuel loose. The fuel might even get ionized depending on the setup. Fancy? This fuel cloud mixes with atmospheric oxygen, flowing around objects and seeping into structures. Then cue the second charge. It detonates the cloud and that's when things get wild. A massive blast wave that can wipe the slate clean. Reinforced buildings, equipment, and unfortunately people, nothing stands a chance. But here's the kicker. Regular countermeasures like sandbags and armor? Nope. I'm not going to cut it against thermobaric weapons. It's like trying to use an umbrella in a hurricane. It doesn't work. A Human Rights Watch report drops some heavy knowledge. The kill mechanism isn't your usual explosive punch, it's the pressure wave, and the real kicker is the subsequent rarefaction or vacuum effect. It's like a double whammy, rupturing lungs and making life seriously unpleasant. Now here's where it gets grim. If the fuel decides to deflagrate but not detonate, those caught in the mix are in for a rough ride, severe burns and inhaling burning fuel. And let's talk about the fuels used in these FAEs. Ethylene oxide and propylene oxide, highly toxic. Is undetonated FA in the mix? Lethal, like dealing with some severe chemical agents. The aftermath? According to a U.S. Central Intelligence Agency study, it's immense. Are those close to the ignition point? Obliterated, those on the fringe. Internal injuries galore, burst eardrums, crushed inner ear organs, severe concussions, ruptured lungs, internal organ damage, and possibly blindness. And here's a chilling speculation from the Defense Intelligence Agency. Victims of FAEs might not be knocked out by the blast, but instead suffer for seconds or minutes while suffocating. It's like a horror show. These weapons are the main event. As we transition from understanding the catastrophic mechanism of vacuum bombs, we must now ask ourselves, what are the harrowing effects of these formidable weapons on structures and the human body? And how do these injuries manifest and challenge modern medical intervention? The detonation of a thermobaric weapon or vacuum bomb unleashes a shockwave or blast wave with devastating consequences. Unreinforced structures and equipment stand little chance of survival in the face of this force, succumbing to rapid destruction. Individuals within the blast range face immediate fatalities, while those nearby are at risk of severe injuries. What sets these weapons apart from condensed bombs or conventional explosives is the prolonged duration of the blast wave, amplifying their destructive potential. The protracted impact intensifies the havoc on the targeted area, leaving a lasting imprint of devastation. The human toll is nothing short of horrifying. In the vicinity of the blast, a human body can be vaporized, leaving behind only the grim aftermath of destruction. Even individuals positioned on the outskirts or near the blast range may not escape unscathed. Internal and invisible injuries become a gloomy reality, including crushed inner ear organs, ruptured lungs, damage to internal organs, and potential blindness. The primary culprits behind these injuries are the pressure wave generated by the explosion and the subsequent vacuum it creates. The forceful compression and decompression of air lead to catastrophic effects on living organisms. Even if the weapon fails to detonate fully, the high temperature fuel cloud it releases poses its own set of dangers. Individuals may suffer severe burns or inhale toxic substances, further exacerbating the toll on human life in the aftermath of such a catastrophic event. The combination of these factors underscores the profoundly destructive nature of thermobaric weapons and the harrowing consequences they inflict on both structures and the human body. The aftermath of a blast is not merely confined to the visible destruction. It extends into the realm of medical repercussions with primary blast injuries emerging as a distinct and complex facet. This comprehensive exploration delves into the intricacies of the medical effects on various physiological systems, unraveling the profound impact of primary blast injuries. Primary blast injuries result from the blast pressure wave, often called the blast wave, emanating from the epicenter of an explosion with pressure reaching thousands of pounds per square inch. To put this into perspective, normal atmospheric pressure is a mere 14.7 pounds per square inch. Described as a combination of shock waves and dynamic overpressure, the damage inflicted depends on the pressure and the duration of its impact. These injuries primarily disrupt air spaces in the body and generate shear forces at air tissue interfaces or between tissues of varying densities. The pulmonary system bears the brunt of primary blast injuries, with the blast wave causing damage to the lobes, ribs, mediastinum, and alveoli. The impact can lead to alveoli rupture, resulting in fluid leakage into the lungs, a condition known as shock lung or blast lung. 
complications may include arterial gas embolisms, pneumothorax, and hemothorax. Respiratory distress related to non-fatal injuries may manifest several hours or even up to 48 hours after the incident. Treatment involves continuous auscultation, monitoring respiratory and pulmonary functions, serial blood gases, erect chest radiographs, and interventions such as oxygen therapy and chest drain placement if necessary. The cardiovascular system faces potential threats in the form of air emboli in the heart or coronary arteries, along with diffuse damage to the myocardium. Detection through auscultation for brutes and monitoring ECG changes is crucial. Symptomatic treatment is essential, focusing on detecting vascular leakage and signs of cardiac tamponade. Auditory damage unfolds in stages, ranging from mild cases with ruptured tympanic membranes and mild hearing loss to severe cases involving disintegration of the membrane and dislocation of ossicles, potentially leading to surgical intervention. The worst cases result in inner ear damage, causing sensorineural deafness, pain, nausea, and balance problems. Patient ear examinations aid in detecting damage with mild cases healing naturally and severe cases requiring surgical intervention. The gastrointestinal system may experience damage, often underdiagnosed, as stress waves cross gas pockets in the bowel. Bruising occurs in mild cases, while severe cases may lead to perforation, particularly at the iliochecal junction. Monitoring for peritonitis and hemorrhaging is crucial, with treatment involving surgery and close post-operative monitoring for complications. Primary blast injuries to the central nervous system predominantly manifest as cerebral arterial gas embolism, causing unexplained deterioration or death. Detection involves monitoring consciousness levels, peripheral nerve function, and retinal vessels for air signs. If hyperbaric facilities are unavailable, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, supplemented by 100% oxygen, is the primary treatment. In conclusion, primary blast injuries have a multifaceted impact on the human body, affecting vital systems from the pulmonary to the central nervous system. Understanding these nuanced medical effects is pivotal in advancing both treatment strategies and post-injury care, providing a holistic perspective on the aftermath of explosive incidents. As we witness the harrowing effects of thermobaric weapons on structures and personnel, we must explore a pivotal question. How are these destructive devices strategically and tactically employed in modern warfare, and what are the broader implications of their use on the battlefield and beyond? Moving to the military domain, significant players have actively engaged thermobaric weapons in various conflicts. Armed forces equipped with vacuum bombs wield a formidable tool capable of clearing expansive areas and serving anti-defense and anti-personnel purposes. Notably, the United States incorporated these weapons into its shock and awe strategy during the Iraq conflict. The United States, during the Vietnam War, extensively employed first-generation CBU-55 fuel air weapons evolving into a second generation used in Iraq during Operation Desert Storm. Notable instances include the use of thermobaric weapons in Afghanistan, with a laser-guided bomb targeting cave complexes housing Al-Qaeda and Taliban fighters. The distinctive features of these weapons, including their wide blast radius and prolonged duration, make them practical tools for overwhelming adversaries and dismantling defensive positions. Their utility extends to destroying military bases or complexes, ensuring the disintegration of a well-fortified military formation. The Soviet Union reportedly used fuel air explosives, FAEs, against China in the 1969 Sino-Soviet border conflict, while the TOS-1 system and MiG-27 attack aircraft with ODAB-500S-P fuel air bombs were utilized during the Soviet-Afghan War. One of the notable advantages of vacuum bombs lies in their effectiveness in enclosed spaces. Bunkers, tunnel complexes, caves, and buildings become vulnerable targets, amplifying the destructive potential of these weapons. Russia, for instance, deployed thermobaric weapons against Mujahideen forces concealed in caves and confined natural spaces in the mountains of Afghanistan, showcasing the adaptability of these munitions in challenging terrains. In the Chechen Wars, Russian forces demonstrated the effectiveness of ground-delivered thermobaric weapons, utilizing systems like TOS-1 and RPOA Schmel. Thermobaric weapons were reportedly used during the Beslan School hostage crisis in 2004. The United Kingdom actively deployed thermobaric AGM-114 and Hellfire missiles in the war in Afghanistan, with British military drones continuing their use in the Syrian civil war. 
Israel's engagement with thermobaric weaponry has drawn attention, with Human Rights Watch and Euromed Human Rights Monitor reporting its past use, including the 2008-2009 conflict in Gaza. Speculation arose in 2023 about Israel's potential use of thermobaric warheads, particularly in the ongoing Israel-Hamas war. Syria, amid conflicts like the Battle of Aleppo and Kafar Batna, witnessed rebel claims of the Syrian Air Force employing thermobaric weapons against residential areas. A UN panel confirmed the Syrian government's use of thermobaric bombs in al qusair in March 2013. Ukraine, in a display of military capability, showcased the destructive power of a thermobaric RGT-27 S2 hand grenade delivered by a drone, targeting a derelict Russian infantry fighting vehicle. Beyond state actors, Non-state entities have employed thermobaric and fuel-air explosives in unconventional warfare. Since the 1983 Beirut barracks bombing in Lebanon, guerrilla warfare has witnessed the use of these devastating weapons. Notably, Jamaa Islamiyah bombers employed a shock-dispersed solid fuel charge based on the thermobaric principle during the 2002 Bali bombings. This complex and alarming landscape underscores the pressing need for international cooperation to regulate and control the use of thermobaric weapons. As these instruments of destruction continue to evolve, their impact on conventional and unconventional conflicts raises ethical, humanitarian, and strategic questions that demand careful consideration on the global stage. Despite their potency, precision strikes are not the forte of thermobaric weapons. Their expansive area of effect makes them less suitable for pinpoint accuracy raising concerns about collateral damage. The use of these weapons in areas densely populated by civilians has drawn criticism, highlighting the ethical and humanitarian considerations surrounding their deployment. These two-stage munitions can unleash colossal explosions that leave devastation in their wake. Delivered through rockets or artillery shells, the modus operandi of these weapons involves a two-fold process that culminates in catastrophic outcomes. Termed colloquially as a poor man's nuclear weapon, thermobaric munitions wield the capability to obliterate any humans within their vicinity. The peril lies in the potential causes of fatality. Victims may succumb to the initial blast, the ensuing shockwave, or the subsequent vacuum, which can mercilessly rupture the lungs of those unfortunate enough to be caught in its grasp. These instruments of destruction earned the moniker Bunker Busters due to their efficacy in dismantling defensive fortifications. Their strategic deployment involves unleashing a barrage from a considerable distance, melting through defensive positions with ruthless efficiency. While initially not designed for urban warfare, the devastating potential of vacuum bombs is accentuated when unleashed in densely populated regions and building complexes. You can imagine if this were contained inside an enclosed space, nothing would survive inside that space, warns experts. The sheer force unleashed by these weapons is capable of causing immediate fatalities. At the same time, the pressure waves have the gruesome potential to rupture internal organs, leaving a trail of unimaginable horror in their wake. The prospect of these weapons being employed in urban areas amplifies the terror, as the destructive capabilities reach unprecedented levels when confined within the structures of a city. In essence, armed forces leveraging vacuum bombs leverage a dual-edged sword capable of clearing vast landscapes and neutralizing entrenched adversaries but also posing challenges in terms of precision and the potential impact on civilian populations. The strategic use of these weapons requires careful consideration of the surrounding circumstances and ethical implications. Transitioning from the strategic and tactical applications of thermobaric weapons, we now confront a critical inquiry. How do the complexities of their use intertwine with the ethical and legal frameworks governing modern warfare? And what challenges do these formidable munitions pose to the conventions of international law and humanitarian concerns? The legality of thermobaric weapons remains challenging, demanding scrutiny of general legal principles, treaty-based rules on environmental impact, and both customary and specific provisions about these weapons. Despite needing a dedicated international instrument addressing their legality, the debate often implicates provisions from various agreements, such as the Hague Regulations, the Geneva Gas Protocol, the CCW Protocol 3, and the Chemical Weapons Convention. Specific regulations and prohibitions regarding thermobaric weapons are notably absent in international agreements. However, indirect connections can be drawn to provisions in the Hague Regulations, 
particularly those related to the prohibition of firearms causing injuries by non-detectable fragments in the human body. Some components of thermobaric weapons, like their fuses, may consist of non-metallic parts, potentially producing fragments escaping X-ray detection. Protocol 1 of the CCW covers weapons with the primary effect of injuring through such pieces. Still, the incidental nature of injuries caused by non-metallic fragments in thermobaric armaments does not automatically subject them to this protocol's prohibition. A thermobaric explosion, characterized by pressure, thermal effects, oxygen consumption, and the release of toxic gases and smoke, presents diverse potential harms. The effects range from choking, suffocation, and poisoning to burns, chemical reactions in the human body, and infections due to contamination. The removal of oxygen is more pronounced in confined spaces like caves when thermobaric weapons are deployed. Despite these effects, it's crucial to note that thermobaric weapons are not primarily designed for asphyxiation or poisoning. Instead, these outcomes are considered secondary or additional effects, distinguishing them from weapons covered by specific declarations and treaties regulating asphyxiating or toxic substances. The absence of a primary design for asphyxiation or poisoning in thermobaric weapons excludes them from the scope of declarations and treaties addressing such weapons. The nuanced distinction between primary and secondary effects becomes pivotal in evaluating the legality of thermobaric weapons under existing international frameworks. While acknowledging their potential for harm, it is essential to differentiate between intentional and incidental effects, ensuring a more accurate assessment of their adherence to international legal standards. This complex legal landscape surrounding thermobaric weapons underscores the need for continued examination and clarification. As conflicts evolve and military technologies advance, legal frameworks must adapt to address the unique challenges posed by emerging weapons. A comprehensive review of the legality of thermobaric weapons contributes to a more nuanced understanding of their place within the broader spectrum of international humanitarian law, emphasizing the importance of aligning legal standards with evolving technological landscapes. The severe suffering caused by thermobaric weapons doesn't automatically render them unlawful. Their legality depends on factors such as adherence to proportionality, considering feasible precautions to protect civilians and objects, and directing the use toward military objectives. While lawful in many circumstances, when meeting these criteria, the use of thermobaric weapons should be avoided in urban or populated areas, similar to heavy explosive armaments. Despite ongoing debates in the media, the legality of thermobaric weapons has yet to be comprehensively reviewed creating a gap that gains significance, especially in conflicts like the one between Russia and Ukraine. The complexity of various forms of thermobaric weapons contributes to the need for more engagement on this issue. In the intricate landscape of global politics and military strategies, efforts to restrain the use of thermobaric weapons have encountered significant challenges. Dating back to 1980, a joint motion by Mexico, Switzerland, and Sweden sought to impose a United Nations prohibition on these devastating arms. Despite recognizing them as enhanced blast weapons, the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research faced obstacles in regulating thermobaric weapons around 2010. In the realm of international law, the deployment of thermobaric munitions, fuel air explosive devices, or vacuum bombs against military targets is not explicitly prohibited. However, concerns arise when considering their use against civilian populations or infrastructure, prompting scrutiny under the United Nations UN Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons CCW. The protocol on incendiary weapons within the CCW may impose restrictions. As of November 2022, all attempts to regulate or limit the use of thermobaric weapons have faced persistent challenges and have yet to yield concrete outcomes. The International Red Cross IRC provides a nuanced perspective on thermobaric weapons, emphasizing that they are not inherently indiscriminate. Often designed with precision targeting capabilities, these weapons aim to minimize collateral damage and reduce the quantity of munitions required to achieve military objectives. While recognizing these potential advantages, the IRC cautions against the use of thermobaric weapons in populated areas due to their wide area impact and the multiple mechanisms of harm they can unleash. Despite the absence of specific legal prohibitions against the use of thermobaric munitions in warfare, their widespread condemnation by non-governmental organizations is evident. The Geneva Conventions, however, explicitly prohibit the use of such weapons against civilians, classifying such actions as potential war crimes. 
Comparisons with the neutron bomb draw attention to a similar historical scenario with no explicit prohibition. Still, the international community collectively recoiled at the horrific nature of the weapon. The acknowledgement of the devastating impact of thermobaric munitions prompts reflection on the ethical considerations surrounding their use in armed conflicts. While not explicitly banned, the global consensus leans towards recognizing their severe humanitarian implications, raising questions about the adequacy of existing international frameworks for addressing evolving challenges in modern warfare.